Um, so uh, this morning, I'm just going to go over a little bit about our tithe and offering. So um, in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Um, when I read that verse, I always think of uh, Cain and Abel. Uh, you know, Cain and Abel, Abel always gave God the, the best parts of, of what he did. Um, and Cain would just give him the scraps. Um, and then from there, uh, Cain got upset and killed his brother because God was blessing Abel so much because Abel was that cheerful giver. He was giving God the best parts of his fruit and in return, God was blessing him. And um, my, my parents would always tell me, pay God, pay yourself, save the rest. Um, and that would always stick with me. Did I do it all the time? No. Um, maybe like 10% of the time. Um, but it always stuck with me, you know, and um, as I'm getting older, as my family's growing, um, that's more of an, a point for me to apply in my family's life. Um, because the last thing I want is a family of canes running around. Um, you know, and so... I, I definitely want to encourage each and every one of you. Um, what my parents always encouraged me was, pay God, pay yourself, and save the rest. Um, and watch what God does. You know, uh, the last challenge I gave a couple Sundays back was, let God, let, let God show you um, what He will do when you give. You know, give and watch what happens. God's ready to bless each and every one of us. Now, a lot of us probably can't give the same amount as other people, and that's fine too. There's scriptures in the Bible and that's too, saying, you know, give what you can, but then also give with that cheerful heart. And so, always remember, just be encouraged. You know, give what you can, and always give with a cheerful heart. Don't give saying, you know what, this is, I could use this for something else. Um, don't do that. You know, give and say, God, I can use this for something else, but I know you're going to bless me with something bigger. Now let's go to bow our heads and pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, Father God. We thank you so much for bringing all of us here today um, safely, Father. God, I just pray right now, um, as we're going to take up tithe and offerings, I pray, God, that uh, the ones that can give, God, you just bless, Father God, and the ones that can, you bless as well, so that they can be in a situation um, to be able to give, Father God. God, just thank you so much for this day, Father. Thank you so much for what you're going to be doing in this church, Father God. And uh, you already know uh, what's going to happen, Father. We we just thank you in advance, Father. We thank you that we could be a part of this, Father God. Uh, we give you all the praise and all the glory in your name. Amen. Amen. So if you guys want to give online, it's going to be anchordenver.org. Correct? So that right? Okay. Um, and then there's a box over by the telephone. Um, if you guys just want to drop stuff in as you leave, um, that's going to be there for you guys. All right, thanks, guys. So we're actually going to invite Ben and his family back up because one of the things we're going to do uh, for our very first service is uh, a baby dedication. And so come on up here. <laughs> Yes, you guys stand right there. Um, yeah, come on around, I'll move this around here. We have these beautiful babies. And so we have Samson here, and Shoshani, and we're just gonna pray for them. And I just wanna challenge you guys as, as, a, as a family. I've known these two for years. We've walked together through so much, and just to see um, your wedding in, in the house, and to see this beautiful baby born, and this girl grow up, I've seen you guys live devoted, and I've seen you two um, dedicated to the Lord. You can pray a dedication over your children, but if you two aren't dedicated to the Lord, they're not going to be able to pick that up. Because what is transferred from parent to children is how you live. 
And I've seen you live faithfully. I've seen you worship Jesus, and I've seen God work in faith through you. So I know these two little ones are going to be awesome. So can we stretch our hands towards them? And we're just going to pray a prayer of dedication and blessing. Father, I thank you so much for this family, for, for Samson, Father God, for the life that you've given him, Lord. The blessing that he has been. Children are a blessing from the Lord, and I thank you for him. For Shoshani, Lord, how you blessed them and brought them together as a beautiful family. And we just pray the prayer of dedication and blessing over these families, over these children, that they may serve you, that they may love you. Father God, that you may preserve them, Lord. I pray for mercy to be extended to these children, so that as they go through the valleys of life, Lord, your hand and your covering is over them. Father God, I bless them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I bless this family, Jennifer and Ben, and, and the things that you are going to do through them, Father God. May your hand be all over their life. May the blessing of the Lord cover them. May you go before them, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Give them a hand. Um, So, um, for some of you that are new, um, well, I got to meet some of you guys this last Wednesday. We were doing some cool stuff in the community. You know, God put it on our heart about six, seven months ago during the pandemic, or maybe over a year ago, to say, hey, this is your time. This is your season to plan a new work. And we were doing Bible study over Zoom, and we were serving a church in the city, and the Lord started stirring in us kingdom expansion. How can the kingdom of God begin to expand? And as we started to ask the Lord, God, where do you want us to expand the kingdom? And we started looking in the area of rebellion. We've lived here for seven years. And we drove back and forth as we served in other churches downtown in the Ethiopian community. And we realized that there was no churches, maybe three or four churches, for about 15,000 people in this community. And we said, God, you love the people of Green Valley Ranch. You love the people of Montbello, of Commerce City, of Reunion. Would you lead us? Would you guide us? If this is where you want us, may your hand be on this. And... Um, we decided to leave church in the city to plant this work. We didn't know what it was going to be like for my wife and I. Um, they say over there, she was singing. Can we just give her a hand? Um, you know, we, we said, okay, God, if it's just us in our living room, if that's what we're going to do to start your work. We'll do it. And we started sharing that vision with a few of our friends who were part of our Bible study. And, and people started to catch their vision with us to say, we want to be a part of this work. We, we want to see what, you're, what God is going to do in that community. And um, we started meeting every other week about two months ago. We were meeting in my house. We didn't have another space. Our board advisory board said, you know, just start meeting, gathering with the people that you have. And so we met in my house and... You know, we didn't have anything to start. And we put on YouTube. We didn't have anybody lead us in worship. So we were singing songs on YouTube and just teaching. And week after week, God began to bring resources. People donated. All the stuff that you see here was donated by churches. LifeGate Church blessed us. Um, Perry and his, he, you know, people want to see God move in this community so deeply. Um, and, and I'm so thankful that you're going to be a part of that in some way. Even your very presence here right now at this moment means that you, your fingerprint is in this work. And so I thank you for that. Um, I, I believe God loves this community so deeply and wants to see kingdom advance from here. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what I want to talk about today is some of the values and vision that we have as Anchor Church. And we can turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Um, we, are, we are anchored for us in who Jesus is. And we'll be doing a seven-week series from now on on the I Am statements that Jesus makes. And, and we started on Resurrection Sunday when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And today, um, I want us to ask this question as we're investigating who is Jesus in our life. 
um, the conversation that he has with his disciples. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, we'll start there. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by the Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you, Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray as I speak that they hear your voice, not mine. Holy Spirit, I pray you move through this room as the spirit of many waters, that you touch hearts and minds, and that you bring the revelation of Jesus Christ, that very thing we need to withstand the gates of hell. Bless, Father God, this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus asked them this question. They're walking to this region of Sister and Philippi, and he asked them, who do people say I am? This is an important question that oftentimes we have to ask ourselves: is who is Jesus in my life? Because for so many years, people have been getting it wrong. People that are seeing Jesus do miracles. By this time, Jesus has done so many miracles. This is his journey on the way to the cross. And he is asking his disciples this question. Do you really know who I am? Have you figured it out? Because once I leave here without the revelation of who I am, you're not going to be able to withstand what is coming. So what are people saying about me? When you guys are in this region of Caesarea Philippi, what are people saying about me? Because they've seen me heal. They've seen me open blind eyes. They've seen me feed 5,000. So what is the word on the street? So I said, well, some, some people say John the Baptist or one of the prophets. You know, people have been getting Jesus wrong since the day we met. That oftentimes we look and we see what he does and say, ah, oh, he's a good teacher. Oh man, he, he's my Easter Sunday, Christmas morning, you know, that's the kind of Jesus I serve. And if that is who Jesus is in your life, that is how you will spend your life. You will invest your life in the way that you perceive him. And since day one, people have been getting Jesus wrong. He said that he's just a convicting teacher like John the Baptist. He's, he's one of the prophets. He speaks well. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the church. Amen. And oftentimes we can get him wrong. And we come to church, we see all the good works, but the power of God operating in our life the way that it needs to, we miss it. Because Jesus isn't the Messiah we needed him to be. Because that's not how we see him. You see, for Jesus, he didn't have a substance problem. He had a perception problem. And how you see Jesus right now is how you will spend your life. If you see him as someone, you can come and go whenever you want. You know, what, what our culture has done to faith and, and relationship with God is we've treated it like a buffet line, right? We take parts of God that we like, we take parts of Jesus that we like, and we say, okay, I, I, I like the love, I like the mercy, I like the goodness, but I, but I don't like this commitment thing. I, I don't like this discipleship thing. I don't like this, I mean, I gotta give everything and follow him. I don't like that part. And we miss pieces of Jesus that are essential to making him who he needs to be. How many of you guys shop at Ikea? Show your hands. Ikea shoppers. I love Ikea. Okay? I'm a huge Ikea fan. We didn't have Ikea for the longest while. Right? So when we went to Denver, I was like, I'm going to use Ikea. Up. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when Hannah was born, and we needed to get a dresser and a changing table years ago. 
and um, yeah, five years ago, um, and we had just moved into our house and we were painting stuff and it was like two weeks from uh, Hannah being born and we we're still trying to put together this dresser and so we went to Ikea and you know when you shop at Ikea you have to be like somewhat of an engineer you know what I'm saying because it comes in a million pieces and you gotta bring it home un unpack it and put it all together and so we, like two weeks before Hannah's born I go to Ikea I get the dresser and we're putting it together and we realize there's pieces missing to the dresser that are essential to the dresser and so I'm going back and forth to Ikea and I'm so frustrated because I'm thinking, man, this thing is supposed to work like it says on the box, right? Yes. Like, and even though I got to put it together, it's still supposed to have all the pieces. And when pieces are missing that are essential, things don't work like it's supposed to. And when you think about your relationship with God, and you've been taking pieces of Jesus, and there are some essential things that are missing you're wondering why Jesus isn't making a difference in your life the way he's supposed to. Because maybe you just see him as a convicting teacher. Maybe you just see him as a good person. Like he just did good things. And he's famous. Maybe you just see it as a religion that you do once a week. But we haven't got to the place where we see him as Messiah. When you get Jesus wrong, your faith never works the way it's supposed to. And this is what Jesus says. Let's see the conversation he's having with them. Who do people say that I am? And they get it completely wrong. You know? Some of them are just like, they, they haven't figured it out at all. So he turns to his disciples because they've been walking with him. He says, but but what do, who do you say I am? Who, who do you say I am? You've been close to me. Everybody else has been seeing me from a distance. You've been walking with me day in day out. Who do you say I am? And so his disciples turn to him and they say, there's Peter. And Peter is one of those fire ones. He gets it wrong a lot, but he gets it right sometimes, right? <laughs> and so he speaks up for the group and he says, man, you are the Messiah. The son of the living God. You are the anointed one. Yep. Jesus replied to him, blessed are you, Simon, for this wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood. Like, I, I can't, I can't, you couldn't get taught this. Like, nobody's going to teach you this in seminary. This is something that was Holy Spirit driven. This is a supernatural encounter with God where you see him for who he really is. And that revelation of Jesus as Messiah, he says, that is the birthplace of the church upon this rock. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. On the rock, on the revelation of Jesus as Messiah. Church is not a religious term. This is the first instance of it. Because there was a group of people that came together that saw Jesus for who he really was, and they said, we believe you to be Messiah. And he says, okay, great, I'm going to birth something right now in this moment called the church, because where we are, Sister I Philippi, where they were walking, was a pagan place, a place of pagan worship. And, and theologians say they would have been close to a rock that was considered the gate of hell because people went into this gay cave in that region and they did all sorts of debauchery. So as Jesus was walking with his disciples in that region, theologians said they probably were standing upon that rock because they worshiped Pan. And all sorts of wicked, evil stuff was happening. But he says the gates of Hades won't prevail against the revelation of Jesus. Let me tell you guys something, church is not a building. The church is not a building. It's not a program. It's not, it's, it's, it's not an idea. It is a people. A people that come together that say, Jesus is our Messiah. He is Lord, Master, and Savior. And we are on assignment to fight against the gates of hell and, and transform lives and communities. The church is called out on mission together because we all have this collective belief that Jesus Christ has become our Messiah. Amen. That's the church. The fact that we have constructed events and programs and buildings to say this is the church is because we've been getting Jesus wrong. 
He is not someone that you feel so concerned with. Right. The church is not a space. We're going to be here for four weeks, and then we're going to move to a school. Because the church is now made up of the space we're meeting in. It's made up of the people that say, we're coming together to make a difference for the kingdom of God. We're living on mission to make our communities better. And we know that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is the only one that can do that in our life. You see, where he is right now, in Sister of Philippi, because it was a place of such pagan worship, the statement he makes that upon this rock, I'm building my church. He, he wasn't in the synagogue. He wasn't in Jerusalem. He wasn't with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He wasn't where everybody had it all together. He was literally standing in a pagan place of worship where it was considered the gate of hell because the church is not made up of perfect people, of good people. It's made up of people that have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's the church has never been about good people. It's about people that get him right. Yes. People that have seen him for who he really is. Listen to 1 Peter 2 9. It says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Ooh, He's calling us out of the very mess of our lives to say, man, you're mine. Like, I want you. I don't know how many of you guys watched the draft on Thursday. I was sweating bullets because I knew the Broncos had a high draft pick. And there was this guy I really wanted, Justin Fields, and we let him slip away. <laughs> Uh, I digress. <laughs> but if Jesus was going to draft people into his church, into his army, he would not have picked the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He wouldn't have been at the temple. He picked a group of messed up fishermen. And they cuss like sailors because they were sailors, right? <laughs> he, he took tax collectors and, and people on the fringes and, 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 and prostitutes and people nobody wanted. And he says, I'm drafting you in the first round. You are now my people. I'm, I'm calling you out of darkness into his marvelous light so that the gates of hell does not prevail against you. You see, Jesus makes a difference in your life when you've been through stuff. Amen. Yes. When you've been through some mess in your life, when you've suffered enough, you get to the place where you say, man, he's Messiah to me. Amen. I need a savior. I, I need someone to come pull me out of the mess that I'm in. I'm not a good person. I wish some of you guys had the opportunity to tell my story. Maybe we'll do one-on-one, -on -one, I'll tell you more. We don't have time. We'll be here all day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because when God found me, I was at the gate of hell. I was a sister at Philippi doing all sorts of crazy stuff I wasn't supposed to be doing. And I needed somebody to come in and pull me out of the mess. And Jesus sends his church, his people, into places of darkness, into places that is devoid of gospel presence, and says, there are people there that I want to draft into my family. That I want to call out of their mess and bring them into life. That I want to love them because right now they're not a people, but they're going to be a people. And the reason I'm planting this church here in Sisera Philippi, the reason this is being birthed right now is so we can stand against the forces of darkness. It's too much spiritual attack going on. Too much suicide, too much mass shootings, too much things that the enemy is just snuffing out people's lives before they need to be. And it's time for the church to stand up and say, we're calling people out of darkness. Because they don't see what they're doing, man. They don't see what's going on. They're living blind and they're missing the joy of who I am in their life. And if Jesus has made a difference in your life, you know what I'm talking about. The church is the earthly expression of a heavenly reality. 
what God intends to happen there, what, what he sees happening there is what he wants to see happen in this life. The ecclesia, the, the fellowship, the gathering of believers. When the church gathers like this, we bring a level of gospel presence. And it says that he's given us keys to the kingdom. Keys to the kingdom. That when we pray, and we worship, and we invite him to invade a space, he literally says, will you loose on earth? Be loose to heaven. Will you bind here? We'll be, we'll be bound there. Like I've given you keys to the kingdom. Over the last eight years plus, we've seen the power of the pen in the presidential office. We've seen more executive orders take place to change laws and change the direction of our country because we know the power of the pen that when the president signs an executive order, everything else has to change. And what Jesus is saying is, let me tell you, church, I've given you an executive pen. I've given you the power to make changes in your community and to pray things into earth that you don't have and that you need. How we got this stuff? Yo, when we started this church, I said, man, we're going to be anchored in two things, God works and in prayer. So every Wednesday on Zoom, it didn't matter that it was a pandemic. Every Wednesday night, we do Bible study. Every Saturday, we pray. And every time we had a prayer request, we said, man, we need a, we need a trailer. We need a trailer for, for the stuff that God is bringing. Let's start praying for a trailer. And we prayed on Saturday night. And I'm telling you, the next week, I go into a conversation with a pastor at LifeGate. Five minutes into the conversation, he says, David, I'm going to give you our trailer, and I'm also going to support your church financially so that you can make a difference in the community. Because God has given us keys to the kingdom. Amen? So when you pray, I, I, we had a board meeting, and the board was like, David, you guys are a church, you guys are gathering, you're doing all that stuff. And I said, man, we don't have anything to start doing the service. And they said, well, just start praying and gathering in your home and watch what God does. The next morning, I get on the phone, and I start calling people. And I'm like, maybe we can get some equipment that's discounted. And I called my friend Perry, and I said, Perry, man, I know you got a ton of equipment. Um, would you be willing to sell us some of your stuff discounted, man? We'll raise the money. He said, David, since I heard you were plans in the church, I started to prepare some equipment for you in my garage. I was waiting for you to call me. You brought all this stuff this morning. You don't need to tell us. That when we begin to pray, things happen. Josh was leading us in worship, and he's going to be going back to Houston, and we need some other musicians. And so we are dropping off the trailer at the storage facility, and the lady that is putting us in the storage facility um, says, well, what's the trailer for? We said, well, we're planting a church. She's like, I've been looking for a church. And I said, oh, that's awesome. And we started encouraging her. She said, do you guys need a drummer? Because I have, I have a kid that loves to play the drums. He's just looking for a place to play. play. And literally the week before, we said, Lord, would you bring more instrumentalists? Would you bring more people into our fellowship? Because God has given us keys to the kingdom. That when we pray, we get to access heaven. We get to bring the resources of heaven into our earthly realm. That's what the church is supposed to be. Jesus says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. That prayer is an essential part of what we do because God has given us an executive order to say, you want to change some things in your community? Stop worrying about it and start praying about it. Start addressing me so that I can bring the stuff that you need to make change and transformation. The church is the earthly expression of the heavenly realm. If you ever go to Ethiopia, um, I recommend you do go visit that. I'm from Ethiopia myself. And we had went a few years ago, oh, maybe like six years ago now. So, um, I remember we were there for a few weeks and we were driving through Ethiopia. There's some beautiful places in Ethiopia, beautiful areas. We were driving through the U.S. Embassy in Ethiopia. 
There are some beautiful places in Ethiopia, and then there's not so much beautiful places in Ethiopia. Um, and you know, there's some things that just need a little bit more work. It's still it's still a third world country, but it's on the it's on the up and up, right? And so, but we were driving through the U.S. embassy in that area, and when you pull up to the U.S. embassy, everything may be dirt around it, but as soon as you walk through the gate of the U.S. embassy, it's green grass, it's marble walls. It's as if you walked into a government office in New York City because the U.S. Embassy represents America. And when you walk in there, it looks like America, even though it's in Ethiopia. And maybe Ethiopia is not at the standard of America, but because it's the U.S. Embassy, it reflects all of America. And Jesus says, I've made my church to be the earthly expression of what's going on in heaven. And so when you step in here, it's as if you're walking in there and you're accessing all the grace, goodness, mercy, hope, joy, everything Jesus would have wanted to give you there, he wants to give you here because the church is the earthly expression of the heavenly reality, amen? Yeah. We should have everything that God intends for us to have. But it starts with the question. Who do you say Jesus is? I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up as we get ready to close. And I'm going to challenge you this morning about your relationship with him. Your relationship with Jesus Christ. If I was to ask you, who is Jesus in your life? Because how you answer that will determine how you've been spending it. Because when Jesus calls us to be his disciples, when he calls us to be his followers, Jesus' command to us is, any man wants to come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. Jesus isn't calling us into a distant relationship with God. Or one that's face to face up close. Amen. And we'll miss the benefits of being part of his family if we don't answer that Jesus is not only a good teacher, a convicting person, that he is Messiah, one of us. And so as the worship team begins to play, I want to ask you a story, ask you a question. Who is Jesus in your life?